Good evening, everyone. Welcome to First Baptist Church Nipola Bible Study on the Gospel of John. And tonight we're continuing, uh, finishing off uh, chapter 4. And it's quite an amazing uh, narration to our attention tonight, the healing of the nobleman's uh, son. Gospel of John, chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. But as usual, as always, as God's children, before we dig into God's Word, let's bow for a prayer, asking for God's help and guidance. Yes, Father God, thank you so much for this day you've given to us by your love, grace, and mercy, for this opportunity to study, to get around your Holy Word, and Lord, we're just asking for your help, for your guidance, bring us uh, through this passage, and help us to understand it. Help me, Lord, to interpret it uh, accurately for the glory for the glory of your wonderful and amazing name. Lord, just be with us, with our church family, with all your children in our community and beyond. The time is running out, the time is short, and you're coming soon to take your bride home. Lord, be with us and bless us. In Christ's name, amen. So, Gospel of John, chapter 4. Uh, I'm sorry for the phone ringing, but that's, that's fine. John, chapter 4, verses 43 through 54. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. Once more he visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. The man took Jesus and his word at his word and departed. While he was still on the way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. When he inquired, as to the time when his son got better, they said to him, Yesterday, at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus had said to him, Your son will live. So he and his whole household believed. This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Amen. So this is um, God's Word, the passage we're studying uh, tonight. Let me start, uh, as usual, as always, with some kind of introduction, uh, just to give us an idea what we're studying tonight in this text. Last Thursday, we talked about how Jesus Christ saved the Samaritan woman and the inhabitants of your hometown in Samaria. The Lord God demonstrated so much love and compassion for the lost during his time in Samaria in the first part of chapter 4 of the Gospel of John. And I hope you do remember, my dear friends, how the Lord powerfully used uh, the testimony of one woman who had met him at the well. Now, we're moving to the second half, or to the second uh, miracle sign recorded by Apostle John in his Gospel, the healing of the nobles, nobleman's son. And before we just move on, let me ask you this. I hope you remember what the first miracle was performed by Jesus. Yes, you're absolutely right. I can hear you saying, when he turned the water into wine at the wedding feast uh, in Cana, Galilee. So, tonight we're studying the second sign of the second miracle performed by Jesus, which are recorded in the Gospel of John. First of all, I just would like to focus your attention on the welcome Jesus received in that part of Galilee, verses 43, 44, and 45. After the two days, 
Remember, Jesus had spent those two days in Samaria, preaching and teaching the good news to Samaritans. After the two days, he left for Galilee. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. So Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, was welcomed by inhabitants of Galilee. Now the question uh, on verse 44. I think it seems to present some difficulty for understanding or for interpretation. Uh, in many English translations of the Bible, actually, it stands in brackets. Verse 44. Now, Jesus himself had pointed out that a prophet has no honor in his own country. How can that be? Is there any contradiction here? Because we have just read that he was welcomed in Galilee. And if you look at the map of Israel... Nazareth is a part of Galilee. It's located geographically in Galilee. Perhaps this verse means that Jesus went into some other parts of Galilee other than Nazareth. So he went to other communities, not to Nazareth at this point, and at other places he was embraced and welcomed. In any case, this statement that a prophet has no honor in his own country is definitely true. That a person is not usually appreciated as much in his own town, his hometown, as he is in other places. That's what the history of mankind actually testifies about. Why did Galileans welcome Jesus? The answer is right here in verse 45. When he arrived in Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him. Why? They had seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the Passover festival, for they also had been there. So they went down to Jerusalem as pilgrims to witness uh, the greatest, uh, one of the greatest uh, Jewish religious festivals. They spent some time there. And pilgrims usually came down to Jerusalem for several days, if not for a week, to stay there. Remember those days, people did not turn the keys in their vehicles and drive. They walked or they used uh, some kind of animals to get there. So, the answer, we have just read it in verse 45. The Galileans saw the miracles and signs performed, demonstrated by Jesus. And they were so much impressed with Jesus' ability to heal any disease. Now, let's talk about the miracle itself, the healing of the royal man's son, and the salvation of his household. It, is, it was not just about the physical healing of that disease, of that fever. Later on, at the end of our Bible study, we're going to see that it created, it generated so much faith in the hearts of that man, and eventually, not just him, but the entire household, his loved ones, family members, and servants, believed in Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world. So, verses uh, 46 uh, through 54, they're dealing with this uh, miracle. But first of all, let me just give you some geographical background of this uh, narration of this miracle recorded by John. The distance between Capernaum and Cana was around uh, 12 uh, miles or 13 miles. I think it could be uh, maybe around 20 kilometers. For us, nowadays, it's like between uh, Nipo and Arden, it's nothing if you drive. But in those days, remember, people walked, but if he was the royal official, he might have used uh, a chariot, some horses, but still it took some time for him to get there. A royal official must have had some faith in the ability of Jesus to heal because he came directly to Christ and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Once more, I'm reading verse 46 and below, he visited Cana in Galilee, that's where Jesus had performed his first miracle, where he had turned the water into wine. 
and there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick at Capernaum. When this man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son who was close to death. He begged Jesus to come and heal his dying uh, son. I just uh, want to emphasize one important thing here. It's connected with the grammar of the original Greek word and uh, sometimes why sometimes often we have to go to the original language to the original manuscript to understand to get some additional information how we can understand the text so this word in new new international version it is bagged in other english uh, versions or translations of the bible i think it says he was imploring but in niv it says he begged the imperfect grammar tense of the word begged erota from erotao to ask or to request from Greek implies repeated and persisted action repeated and persisted action as loving father whose son was at the death door whose son was dying he was begging he was just following Jesus he was pleading him to come and heal his son and for those of us who are parents who have been blessed to have children, we easily can understand how much we love, how much affection we have for our, own, for our own children. If something goes wrong with our child, oh, it just brings us so much grief, so much stress as parents. Remember one more thing, I want to mention it here. Since he was the royal official, or the noble man, as in other English translations of the Bible, he probably was a man of some influence. He was not a poor fellow. He probably belonged at least to middle class, maybe upper middle class of those days. And swallowing his pride, he was a royal official. This man begged to, for help from a carpenter's son. Jesus Christ, at least in the Gospel of Matthew 13, 55, and Mark 3, uh, chapter 6, verse 3, those two verses, they tell us how Jesus was known. Many people called him the carpenter's son. The carpenter's son. So this rich fellow, this government official, royal official, came and he's begging and begging carpenter's son to come and heal his uh, own child. What was Jesus' response? Let us read verse uh, 48. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told him, you will never believe. Hmm. Unless you people see signs and wonders, you will never believe. Very, very interesting. I, I would say, I would dare say, like baffling answer from the mouth of Jesus. What Jesus, uh, what did he mean by his response? So... I would say that was my conclusion I came up with when I was studying this text, that Jesus' response was not necessarily a rebuke of this noble man and his request. It was rather Jesus' lament at the spiritual condition of the people in general, both living in Judea and in Galilee. Because Jesus had already spent some time doing and performing all those miracles and he was clearly able to see why so many people came to see and hear him. In Samaria, just if we remember the context, uh, some verses before this narration, in Samaria Jesus was recognized and accepted absolutely without any signs and wonders. At least at that time, during his two days he spent in that town, and uh, that's where he met that Samaritan woman. The text has no evidence, has no proof that Jesus performed anything or something spectacular in that town. No, he just preached, he taught, he explained the good news to the residents and many Samaritans believed. So, seeing is believing. You probably heard this expression many times in your life. Seeing is believing. Was and is the pragmatic philosophy of the lost world, even in the religious world 
you can see, you can find this approach. I would never believe before I see something. Many people desired to see miracles before they would believe. In general, as we read the New Testament, we find that Christ was not pleased with a faith that was based on miracles. He was much more pleased when people believed his word alone. That was, pleased, that was pleasing to God, to Christ. The Lord Jesus teaches us that we should first believe and then we will see. What followed Jesus' response in verse 48? Where well, I continue in verse 49. The royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Come down before my child dies. When people of influence come to God, they must become beggars. We have people of influence nowadays around us, and sometimes, unfortunately, those people, they think that they're the kings of the earth, they have power, prestige, money, all kinds of uh, things uh, they can enjoy in this life, in this flesh, and they think that it's forever, and they are never vulnerable. But this story, this narration is telling us that even people in power, even people who had many things, many possessions in this life, they have troubles, they have trials in life. His son was dying, his son was at the death door, and this official, again in verse 49, he is very persistent. He keeps saying to the Lord, Sir, come down before my child dies. Come down. I need you to be there physically present. I probably need you to pray, laying hands on my son, just touching him, his body. Again, the Lord Jesus, according to the message of the, the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was much more pleased when people believed his words. So, in verse 49, that's what happened. He became a beggar, this uh, royal official. There was sincerity in his plea. He believed that Christ could heal his son. But Jesus had much more in his mind than physical healing for the royal official's son. By healing his son physically, we're going to see that pretty soon, the great physician moved to heal the father spiritually. Verse 50 says, Go, Jesus replied, your son will live. Just a few words. Go and your son will live. And Jesus created here a dilemma of faith for this royal official. This noble man was forced by the Lord to make the hard choice between insisting on evidence and showing by this his unbelief and of expressing faith without any proof to encourage him. And he learned by the compulsion of the necessity. He was a loving father. He loved his son. His son was dying. The time was running short. And the man believed Jesus and started to return home. And that required, my dear friends, lots, lots of faith. And how did the Lord encourage him in the faith? But let's continue our reading. Verse 51 and below. While he was still on the way, that his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. We can't imagine, we can't fully comprehend his emotions, his reaction as loving father. He's walking. Or he is probably in his chariot. We don't know for sure. He was in the royal official. He was on the way back to Capernaum. He took the words of Jesus. He believed them. He literally believed Jesus' words. And he was on the way. And what an encouragement. What uh, the great news he heard from his servants. Verse 52. Uh, we can see here clearly how his faith was growing and how much encouragement he received uh, in his faith from the Lord. Verse 52 says, When he inquired as to the time when his son got better, 
he was very much interested in the exact time of the healing of the miracle. They said to him, yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever left him. Verse 53, then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus has said to him, your son will live. Can you imagine? The joy overwhelmed his heart, the appreciation, the gratitude to the Lord for this miraculous uh, healing. So, and um, in verses 51 and 52, we can see how his faith was growing. The answer from his servants revealed that the healing happened instantly. It was not gradual healing. At the time Jesus said those words, go and your son will leave, the healing took place. It had taken place instantly. And what was the response of the nobleman and his household? The timing was miraculous and the son's recovery was more than even circumstances could have brought about. They all believed in Jesus Christ. Let me just read uh, the second half of verse 52, 53. So he and his whole household believed. Not just his family members, the servants, from our tax, clearly we can see that, that he was quite rich, he could afford having servants. And you know what? It just reminded me one more conversion from the book of Acts in chapter 16, and I, I cannot stop myself from uh, not reading this passage to your attention. If you can go with me to the book of Acts chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. It's about the conversion of another entire household. Uh, Acts chapter 16, verses uh, 29 through 34. The jailer, called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. It happens when God miraculously set his missionaries free. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his household were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole household. Praises, praises be to God for his mercies. So we are back in our chapter 4 of the Gospel of John. The royal official learned that it was not necessary for the Lord to be physically present to perform a miracle or answer a prayer. And this should encourage all Christians in their prayer life. It should be a source of our great joy and encouragement. Believers in Christ have a mighty God who hears our requests and who is able to work out His purposes in any part of the world at any time. Any part of the world and at any time, because our God we believe in is Almighty. He is El Shaddai. Verse 4054 says, the final verse of our uh, text, This was the second sign Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. It was the second sign Jesus performed in the Gospel of John. The first one was when he turned the water into wine at the wedding in Cana of Galilee. Conclusion or application. Number one, in the first miracle at the wedding, Jesus Christ showed his power over time. Jesus made the wine instantly. In the second recorded miracle in the Gospel of John, Jesus showed his power over distance, over 
space. Remember, it was around 20 kilometers between Capernaum and Canaan. 20 kilometers. But Jesus, God in human flesh, just said the words, Go and your son will leave, and it happened. Application number two. The royal official trusted the word that Jesus spoke, and so should we. If he could do it, if he could believe and trust in Jesus' words, we should do it the same way. Number three, conclusion or application. One of the names of the Lord in Scripture is Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals. Our Lord is merciful, loving, and compassionate. He can heal any disease if it is His will and plan for a person. The Lord God, Jehovah Rapha, is able to heal any disease if it's a part of His sovereign will and sovereign plan for a person. And one quote before a closing prayer from an American pastor, John Corson, who said in his application commentary in 2005, the following words, It is the Lord who heals, and He can use any method He chooses. It is the Lord who heals, and He can use any method He chooses. God can heal you directly. God can answer your prayer for healing. God can use medical people, doctors and nurses with uh, equipment to bring healing, to bring relief to our physical needs. But to God be the glory always and forever and ever. And for this miracle, for this sign we have just studied tonight, God bless you and keep you sane and safe. Let's pray and give God the glory. Our triune God, God Creator, the author of the Holy Scripture, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. We are bowing and worshiping before your greatness and majesty, your power, your omniscience, omnipresence. We are just uh, so thankful to you, God, for your mercy, for your grace in our lives, for every day we take for granted. Lord, uh, during this crisis, you're, you have reminded us already how many things we have taken for granted. Even our freedoms and liberties, uh, freedom of worship, freedom of travel, many, many other freedoms. We took them for granted. We thought, we were thinking that it would be forever in this world, as long as we live in this flesh. But Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your grace, for the glorious, wonderful plan of salvation. Thank you for the faith of that royal official. Thank you for your power, for your mercy you demonstrated on that day in Cana of Galilee when you said those words to him, Go, your son will live. And he believed. Lord, if we are lacking faith today, nowadays, Lord, increase our faith. Increase our faith and teach us how to pray. And Lord, uh, encourage us to continue the faith, waiting faithfully and joyfully for the rapture of the church. Lord, you promised that you would come to take us home. And right now, you are preparing the heavenly abodes for your children. And when your time comes, according to your clock, you will come and get us where we belong to. But meanwhile, while we're here in this world, bless us, protect us, encourage us to serve you faithfully and joyfully until our last breath, or until the rapture of your bride. That's what we prayed for. In the name of Jesus Christ, the only Savior of the world, in the name of Yeshua Mashiach, in Christ's name, we pray and ask for this. Amen.